All right, so today we're going to be talking about parallel resonant circuits. So let's consider the following network. I'm very confused as to why you all are still talking when I'm trying to give a lecture. So let's say that we have a network consisting of just a resistor R like so in parallel with some inductance L. in parallel with some capacitance C. And I'm going to define the voltage drop across the network as a whole as V, the current flowing into the network as a whole as I, without a subscript, my apologies. And then I'm gonna define each of my component currents as follows. So my resistor current will be direction down through the resistor. Uh, my inductor current IL will be direction down through the inductance. And my capacitor current IC will be direction down through the capacitance. Okay. So because we're dealing with a parallel network, instead of dealing with impedances, um, we're going to choose to deal with admittances, which uh, this is the first time we've ever really used admittance for anything. So just as a quick refresher, uh, you guys should have learned this uh, back in circuits too, um, but some admittance Y is simply the reciprocal of the impedance Z. Okay, So our input admittance for this network is y in as a function of j omega will be one over the resistance plus one over j omega l plus j omega c um, and i can break that into a constituent real and imaginary part so our real part of our admittance, which is just our conductance, is 1 over R. And then our imaginary part of our admittance, which is our susceptance, will be omega C minus 1 over omega L. Okay. Um, so from this expression... Excuse me. We can easily see that resonance occurs when omega C is equal to one over omega L, because that will make the imaginary term go away, and our resonant frequency is then omega naught is equal to the square root of one over LC. So the exact same thing that we saw for a series resonant circuit. So I'm gonna make a plot of the magnitude of YN and the phase of YN. So on our magnitude plot, this is going to look very, very similar to what we saw for a series resonant circuit. So I have my admittance on the y-axis 
and frequency on the x-axis like so. Um, so let's put our resonant frequency omega naught here somewhere towards the middle. Um, and at our resonant frequency, we are just going to have um, an admittance of 1 over r, right? So this point right here is just 1 over r. Um, at lower frequencies, actually, um, the network admittance is dominated by the inductance, and so it'll be larger, so something like this, and I'm just going to put L dominant over here. And then for frequencies higher than the resonant frequency, our capacitor is the dominant admittance. Like so. Um, so at our resonant frequency, that's when our admittance is at its lowest which means our voltage is actually at its highest. Um, if we look at our phase, it's going to look very similar to what we saw dealing with our series circuits as well. So on our y-axis is our phase as a function of j omega. Um, here's omega, we'll put omega naught somewhere in the middle, and we know that at omega naught, our admittance is purely real, so there should be zero phase angle, and what we're going to see is that it's going to start at negative 90 degrees, because it's inductance dominant, and we're dealing with admittance, so it should be the opposite sign on our angle, and then as we get into capacitive dominant, area, it's going to transition to positive 90 degrees. So it should look something like this on a phase diagram. So let's look at our energy storage relationships for a simple circuit. So if we have some steady state sinusoidal excitation current, um, IS as a phaser connected to our RLC network, like so. Um, so let's say, let's call this an impedance of J omega L. Here's an impedance of one over J omega C. Here's the voltage drop across our capacitor. And here is the current flowing through our inductance. Um, let's say that I S is I M with a phase angle of zero degrees amps. So at resonance, we have J omega L in parallel with one over J omega C is equal to zero. And from this, we could say that our capacitor voltage VC is just going to be our phasor current IS times R. Right, So uh, the voltage drop across the capacitor is the same thing as the voltage drop across the resistor because they're all connected in parallel, and we know that none of our current branches off and flows into um, our inductor or our capacitor uh, because at the resonant frequency, effectively both of those things are going to look like open circuits. Okay, So this gives us then uh, just... Doing simple substitution, um, I M times R with an angle of zero degrees volts for our capacitor voltage, um, which in turn 
means that we are going to have a time domain voltage of the C of T is going to be I M times R cosine omega naught T plus zero degrees volts. Um, our stored energy is one half C times our capacitor voltage as a function of time squared. Um, so that's going to look like one half C times I M R cosine omega naught T quantity squared. And I feel like I'm missing a factor too. Let me check something real quick. Okay, I see what I'm doing here. Um, so this is going to come out to be, so let's see, I'm going to have an I M squared, an R squared, a C in my numerator. All of this is over two. And then I'll have cosine squared, omega naught T. And my units here should be in joules. Um, using Ohm's law. Uh, energy stored by the capacitor. Uh, so using Ohm's law, our inductor current is phasor current IL is just going to be the voltage drop across our capacitor divided by the impedance of our inductor, which is J omega L. Um, so this is going to look like one over J omega naught L since we're operating at resonance. And then my current, uh, excuse me, my voltage is I M R with an angle of zero degrees volts. And so this is going to be simply I M R over omega naught L with an angle of minus 90 degrees amps, um, which in the time domain looks like I M R over omega naught L cosine. Actually, that will be um, because of the phase angle of minus 90 degrees. Let me think about this really quickly here. Um, Sine omega naught T amps. So let me think about this. So to go from cosine to sine, I add 90 degrees. Okay, yep, so that's right. Okay, um, so from here, our energy stored by our inductor is one half L times my current squared. Um, so that's going to be one half L times I M R over omega naught L sine omega naught T amps in total squared, which is going to look like, let's see. I am squared R times, excuse me, I am squared R squared L over twice omega naught squared L times sine squared omega naught T. And my units for this whole thing should be in joules. Um, Oh, 
just an L actually. <laughs> That should be an L squared, right? Yeah. Thank you for that. So, no, so I have an L in the numerator by itself from this guy right here, and then I have an L squared in the denominator because I'm squaring this whole thing. So right now I have it as L over L squared. And then that's going to look like a factor of, so this guy right here cancels that guy right there. Um, so what I want to do now is get rid of that omega naught squared, right? So omega naught squared is one over LC, right? We go up here where we found omega naught. So if this is omega naught and we square it, we would have a factor of one over LC. So if I substituted in one over LC right here, what that's gonna wind up giving me is I am squared R squared times C over two, are we okay with that? Okay, and then this will be times sine squared omega naught t, and this whole thing is in joules. Our total stored energy is then, so I'm just going to write this as Ws as a function of time. This is going to be my capacitor stored energy plus my inductor stored energy. Um, and so if we look back here, we have Im squared R squared C over 2 times cosine squared. So Im squared R squared C over 2 cosine squared omega naught t plus sine squared omega naught t, goodness gracious. And very obviously this whole thing is just one. So I have effectively a fixed amount of stored energy. So I didn't draw the graph out here like I did when we dealt with our series resonance circuits, but effectively we have another situation to where the capacitor and the inductor are just constantly exchanging energy between the two and they're exactly 90 degrees out of phase, right? Or excuse me, they're exactly 180 degrees out of phase. So whenever the capacitor stored energy is at its maximum, the inductor stored energy is at its minimum, and it's just passing that energy back and forth, back and forth. Um, our energy dissipated per cycle, so effectively what the resistor is doing, is going to be WD is the integral over exactly one cycle or one period of our system. This is the power absorbed by the resistor as a function of time. Um, and so that's going to look like the integral over one cycle of our capacitor voltage as a function of time squared divided by the resistance, right? V squared over R, this is power absorbed by a resistor. And so when we substitute that in, we get one over R times IMR 
cosine omega naught t quantity squared dt. Um, and we've seen this thing enough times to know that when we square this, we're going to have effectively a DC term and an AC term. And the integral of the AC term over exactly one period is always zero. So we're just left with one half I m squared R times R period. And because we know that R period is related to our angular frequency, this becomes two pi times I m squared R over twice omega naught. So let me just make a note over here really quickly. Um, T is equal to two pi over omega naught in this case. All right, so we know our stored energy, we know our energy dissipated per cycle. So from these two pieces of information, we can determine Q, right? So from this, the quality factor of a parallel RLC circuit is Q is equal to 2 pi times the energy stored over the energy dissipated. That's always our definition. So that's going to look like 2 pi times 1 half I m squared R squared C divided by 2 pi I m squared R over twice omega naught. And let's cross out some things. So the 2 pi cancels the 2 pi. The I m squared cancels the I m squared. I have an R squared here in the numerator that's going to be canceled by this guy right here. Um, I have a 1 half that's going to cancel that factor of 2 um, down there. And so I could pull the omega naught from the denominator of my denominator up into my numerator. And so that effectively just gives me omega naught times R times C, um, which could be also be expressed as R times the square root of C over L, um, which is the same thing as R over omega naught L. So what does the quality factor of a parallel RLC circuit look like as compared to the quality factor of a series RLC circuit? reciprocals effectively yes exactly right so for our series rlc circuit we had omega naught l over r for our quality factor or one over omega naught rc here in parallel we literally just have the reciprocal which makes sense because we're dealing with admittances instead of impedances which are just reciprocals of each other okay so let's look at our transfer functions now. Um, so
So I'm just going to take my sinusoidal input excitation current. I'm going to call it I n like so. Here's R. Here's an impedance of J omega L. Here's an impedance of one over J omega C. And our output voltage is just the voltage drop across everything. The reason why I'm defining um, this particular output voltage is because if we wanted any individual current as our output, so if we wanted a current trans, um, transfer function, we could literally just take V out and divide it by the impedance that we're interested in to immediately get those other transfer functions that we're interested in. So this is our most general case, effectively. Okay. So... Um, Using Ohm's law, our output voltage V out is literally just going to be our current divided by our input admittance. So that's just going to be I in divided by one over R plus J times omega C minus one over omega L. And we can put this in terms of our quality factor and our resonant frequency, right? So just from what we learned a couple of moments ago, we know that Q is equal to omega naught RC or R over omega naught L. And so what that lets us do is write this as, um, so let's, let's go one step further here. So let's multiply everything through by a factor of R over R first. So we would have R times I N over one plus J omega R C minus r over omega l, right? I could then multiply by q over q uh, in my denominator. So that's going to give me r times i n over um, 1 plus j q times omega r c over q minus R over omega LQ. And now substituting in my relationships, we have R times I N over one plus JQ times omega over omega naught minus omega naught over omega which looks almost exactly the same as the transfer function that we derived for our series resonant circuit, except that we've got a factor of R in the numerator instead of a factor of one in the numerator. Um, so effectively, all that R is doing is converting that input current into a voltage. Omega oh, sorry. Um, bu -bu 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 -bu. That one shouldn't have a not. Thank you for that. So from this, H of J omega, which is just the ratio of V out to I in, is R over one plus JQ times omega over omega naught minus omega naught over omega. And our magnitude plot is then R divided by the square root of one plus 
squared times omega over omega naught minus omega naught over omega quantity squared. All of that is underneath our square root sign. And then our phase plot is the inverse tangent of negative Q omega over omega naught minus omega naught over omega. <laughs> All right, so half power frequencies and all of that kind of good stuff. Um, so the half power frequencies will occur when the magnitude of H of J omega is equal to R divided by the square root of two. I think I mentioned this in class um, last week, but effectively we know that the peak value of our transfer function um, is going to be R in this case. And so our half power frequencies are gonna be whatever that peak is multiplied by a factor of one over the square root of two. Okay, so that's why it's R over the square root of two as opposed to one over the square root of two like we had for our series RLC circuit voltage transfer function, okay? So effectively, we just need our denominator to look like um, the square root of two, which is the exact same conditions that we had previously. So we know that Q times omega over omega naught minus omega naught over omega has to be equal to plus or minus one. And from this, we'll find that omega low, excuse me, is omega naught times negative one over two Q plus the square root of one over two Q quantity squared plus one. omega high is effectively the exact same thing, but we're gonna change the sign on that first term. So positive one over two Q plus the square root of one over two Q squared plus one. And then our bandwidth, I'll just tuck it in over here, is omega high minus omega low, which simply is omega naught over Q yet again. So our parallel resonant circuit behaves pretty similarly to our series resonant circuit. It's just uh, our ratio is now um, output voltage to input current as opposed to output voltage to input voltage. And like I said, we can very easily um, adapt this for other transfer functions that we might be interested in simply by um, dividing this guy right here by an impedance, right? If we know V out and we divide that by any of our other impedances, that'll give us the currents through any of the other elements that we're interested in. Okay, so now let's talk about our other resonant form. So this is where things start to get kind of interesting. So with what we just dealt with, both with series RLC circuits and parallel RLC circuits, we had a situation to where we assumed that our inductors and capacitors were ideal, uh, meaning that our inductance, uh, the winding of our inductance didn't have any resistance or anything like that. Um, and the terminals of our capacitance didn't have any resistance or anything like that either. A more realistic model for 
a parallel RLC circuit. Would be something like this. So I'm gonna have a resistance here. I'm gonna call it R2. And I'll talk about what it represents here in a moment. Then I'm going to have in this branch an inductance in series with some resistance R1. And then over here to the right, I will have some capacitance C. So R1 represents the ohmic core and radiation losses of the coil L. So we are taking into account the fact that our coil is made of real wire that has a resistance. We're also taking into account that we're gonna lose some amount of energy by magnetizing our core material of our coil. Um, and then we're also taking into account that we might lose some flux by having a solenoidal coil versus a toroidal coil. So we're gonna lose energy as our field dissipates in the area around it. And we're lumping all three of those losses together as a resistance representative of that total contribution of energy loss. Okay. R2 represents the dielectric losses of the capacitor. as well as wire resistances for the circuit. And we could really lump any actual resistance that we have in parallel with that as well. Okay. So in this particular model, there is no way for us to combine our elements together to produce either a series uh, RLC circuit or a parallel RLC circuit that is valid over all frequencies. So instead, we're gonna figure out how we can develop a simplified model that is valid over a frequency range large enough to include the frequencies that we are interested in. Okay, Caro. Yes. The non-ideality of the capacitor in addition to any external resistance, like like literally just fixed value resistors that we might be including in our network as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... What we're effectively investigating is how to transform this into the following network where we would have just some resistance, which I'm going to call RC in parallel with some inductance, which I'm going to call LC in parallel with some capacitance, which I'm gonna call C sub C. And this model will only be valid
over specific frequency bands. Okay. All right. So let's consider the following networks. Okay. So let's say that I have a network containing some resistance RS, where the subscript S literally just means series. And it is connected to some reactants, JXS, like so. So this reactance could be contributed by an inductance, or it could be a capacitance. And at this point, it literally doesn't matter. I just have a resistance in series with either an inductance or a capacitance. And at some particular frequency, um, I have some reactance XS, which could be positive or negative. So if it were an inductance, this thing would be positive overall. If it were capacitance, their reactance would be negative. Um, the quality factor for this simplified network is just going to be the magnitude of the reactance divided by the resistance. And I'm going to define an impedance looking in and an admittance looking in as ZS and YS for this particular thing. So similarly, I can have a parallel network. Let me put it over here to the right where I might have some resistance RP. In parallel with some reactants. JXP like so, the quality factor of this network is simply RP over the magnitude of XP. And once again, I'm going to define some impedance ZP and some admittance YP looking into the terminals of this network. And so what we're going to spend the next few minutes doing is developing a transform that allows us to go back and forth between these two forms, which will allow us to make things look like simple parallel circuits or simple uh, series circuits, as the cases may be. Okay. So let's start by looking at our impedances, excuse me, uh, our admittances. Okay. So if we look on the series side, our admittance Ys is literally just going to be 1 over Rs plus J excess. Okay. So that's just 1 over the series impedance, right? Nothing wild or crazy there. Well, if I multiply this guy by the complex conjugate of the denominator over the complex conjugate of the denominator, I wind up getting Rs minus Jxs divided by Rs squared plus Xs squared. If I look at my network on the right, I'm just going to treat this as two admittances in parallel. And so I can simply add them together to find the total admittance of this thing, right? So that's just going to be simply one over RP. And then I'm going to have a J times one over XP over here. And I'm arbitrarily going to choose to put a minus sign right there just because I have a minus sign here in front of my imaginary part of my series guy. 
So I'm putting a minus sign on the other side. Effectively, I'm just assuming that that reactance is negative in order to have parity on both sides so that I have um, a real part and an imaginary part and they both have the same signs, okay? And this is my admittance Y sub P. So if I solve for RP and XP in terms of RS and XS, I get the following relationships. So RP is just going to be RS squared plus XS squared over RS and XP is just going to be RS squared plus XS squared over XS. Now what I'm going to do is something similar, but instead of looking at admittances, I'm going to look at impedances and set them equal on both sides, right? So for the series side, I'll have ZS is equal to simply RS plus J XS. And on the parallel side, I have RP in parallel with JXP, which can be written as J RP XP over RP plus J XP. And then I could multiply by the complex conjugate of the denominator over the complex conjugate of the denominator to break this down into a simple real part and an imaginary part. And that results in the following relationships. RP times XP squared over RP squared plus XP squared plus J RP squared times XP over RP squared plus XP squared is my parallel impedance ZP. And so now, solving for RS and XS in terms of RP and XP, yields the following relationships. So RS is just RP XP squared over RP squared plus XP squared and XS is simply RP squared XP over RP squared plus XP squared. So now I can transform back and forth between those two forms and we can take a moment here and actually put everything in terms of quality factors and all of that kind of good stuff as well. Okay. Yes, yeah, so that should be a squared on the front term. Thank you for that. Sorry. All right. So in terms of network quality factors, actually, before we do this, I just want to make sure um, you guys are effectively catching what I'm throwing. All I'm doing here is saying, essentially, 
the real part of this guy over here has to equal the real part of this guy over here. The imaginary part has to equal the imaginary part and then the exact same thing down here. So this RS has to be equal to this guy. This XS has to be equal to that guy. That's literally all we're doing. It's saying the real part on the left-hand side of the equal sign is equal to the real part on the right-hand side. The imaginary part on the left-hand side is equal to the imaginary part on the right-hand side. I hope there aren't any more issues with signs or missing squares or anything like that, but that's all that I'm trying to illustrate here, just in case. Anyway. All right, so in terms of network quality factors, these transformations... can be expressed as um, so we'll have RP is equal to RS squared plus S XS squared over RS. So if I multiply this thing by a factor of RS over RS, what I get is RS times RS squared plus XS squared over RS squared, which is the same thing as RS times one plus XS squared over RS squared. And because I'm squaring excess, that's the same thing as the magnitude of excess squared. So the sign on my reactants literally doesn't matter. So this just comes out to be RS times one plus Q squared. Similarly, XP is RS squared plus XS squared over XS. So now I'm going to multiply through by XS over XS, giving me RS squared plus S XS squared over XS squared. So that is XS times 1 plus RS squared over XS squared is xs times 1 plus 1 over q squared. And then rearranging these relationships or deriving them new is going to get us the same result either way, so I'm going to do it the lazy way. Um, rs is just going to be rp over 1 plus q squared. And XS is just going to be XP over 1 plus 1 over Q squared. All right, we are almost done. So four quality factors greater than or equal to five. Little error is introduced by using these approximate relationships. Greater than or equal to five. Let me draw that better. That still looks like garbage. Greater than or equal. Is that more clear, Carter? Okay. So, RP will be approximately just RS times Q squared. Right, so for a quality factor greater than five, you know, 25 looks like approximately 26, so we're going to get pretty close, okay? And then 
our parallel reactants will be effectively the exact same thing as our series reactants. So this tells us effectively that our parallel capacitance CP will be approximately equal to our series capacitance or our parallel inductance LP will be approximately equal to our series inductance LF. And then going the other way around, our series resistance RS will be approximately equal to RP over our quality factor squared. And so our series reactance XS will be approximately equal to our parallel reactant XP. So CS is approximately CP or LS is approximately LP. All right, so let's work a relatively quick example to where we might need this to figure out what's going on. So let's say that we have the following simple series RLC circuit. Okay. So I've got an excitation source as an RMS phaser, 0 0.5 volts RMS. And our excitation frequency omega is just at our resonant frequency for our system. And the system that I'm interested in is a 20 ohm resistor in series with a 10 millihenry inductance in series with a 0 0.01 microfarad capacitance. So these are all just real valued things that we could go get out of the supply closet over in Nefkin Hall, okay? And I'm interested in figuring out what the magnitude of the voltage drop across my capacitor is going to be. So let me ask you guys a question. If you were in the lab and you were trying to measure the RMS voltage drop across that capacitor, what piece of equipment would you use? A multimeter. If you only need the magnitude of the voltage, you'd probably use a multimeter, right? How many of you guys know how a multimeter works? So you would put your multimeter in parallel across our element, right? So we've got some voltmeter here. What's the internal resistance of a voltmeter? Usually pretty high, somewhere in the ballpark of 100 kilo ohms. So by placing a multimeter in parallel with this series RLC circuit, we now have it in a form that it doesn't look like a series RLC circuit anymore if we're taking into account the fact that our measurement device can introduce some amount of error. So I want us to see if we can figure out what the error that's introduced will be, okay? So leaving the multimeter out of the circuit, this is a simple series RLC circuit, right? So because it's a simple series RLC circuit, we know that our resonant frequency should be 1 over LC, take the square root of that whole thing, and that's going to come out to 10 to the 5 radians per second, or 100,000 radians per second. Our quality factor Q, omega naught L 
over R is going to be 50. So pretty darn high. And the bandwidth for this circuit would be omega naught over Q, which is going to come out to be 2,000 radians per second. So if we were performing just strict circuit analysis and we wanted to find out what the magnitude of our capacitor voltage is, what would we do? Voltage division or something like that, right? So um, we know that at resonant frequency, so just as a quick thing here, So at resonance, X from our inductance cancels the reactance of our capacitance. And so our current um, I would just be equal to our voltage, 0 0.5 volts RMS divided by our 20 ohms of resistance. Which would look like 25 milliamps RMS. And then from this, we could say um, current times impedance. So VC is going to be the magnitude of I times the magnitude of one over omega C. So let's just do that. That times one over, let's see, um, 10 to the five times C is 0 0.01 times 10 to the minus six. So I get 25 volts RMS. By the way, the magnitude of VC in this case is literally just Q times the magnitude of our source voltage. And that'll always be true for a circuit operated at resonance. So circuit analysis tells us that we should be expecting roughly 25 volt drop across our capacitor. Okay. Now let's look at our real circuit, right? Our practical circuit, including the impedance of our voltmeter. So once again, we've got 0 0.5 volts RMS. We've got our 20 ohms of resistance. Our 10 millihenries of inductance. Our 0 0.01 microfarads of capacitance. And this 100K resistance over here represents the impedance of our multimeter. And we're now looking for this voltage VC. Now, we know enough to where we could literally analyze this circuit and see what the issue is, but let's use our transformation to put it into something pretty trivial, okay? So, um, Let's start by saying, so let's see. So what's RP in this case? So actually, let me explain what we're doing a little bit better. What I want to do is use the transform that we just derived 
to convert this parallel RC network into a series RC network so that we can effectively just figure everything out using voltage division or something easy without having to get into the nitty gritty details and all of that kind of good stuff. Okay. So what's our parallel resistance? 100 kilo ohms, right? What is our parallel capacitance? Well, quite obviously, it's 0 0.01 microfarads. And so our parallel reactants, just our magnitude of this guy, that's just going to be 1 over omega naught C, right? Um, so that would be 1 over 10 to the 5 radians per second times 0 0.01 microfarads should come out to a thousand ohms, I believe. Yep. So if we're doing our transform, What would XS be? So let's scroll back up here really quickly. <laughs> so XS. Excuse me, did I say RS or XS? We're going to do both of them. Crap. So let's do RS first. So RP times XP squared over R squared plus X squared. And then we'll do it over here so there's enough space. So RS is RP times XP squared over RP squared plus XP squared. Throw that into your calculator, please. Tell me what you get. Okay, so really close to 10 ohms. XP is RP squared XP over RP squared plus XP squared. Tell me what you get here, please. Give me 999.9000. Nine ohms. So approximately one kilo ohm. When I calculated the value of this capacitance, this came out to be 10.001 nanofarads which is effectively the exact same thing as 0 0.01 microfarads. So what we're getting, if we were paying attention, is something extremely close to what we would be getting if we just use our approximation, because our quality factor for this network is rather high, right? What is the quality factor for just this network by itself, where we have the 100K resistor um, in parallel with a... 1k reactants so let's just scroll back up here and look so it should be rp over xp so a hundred thousand over a thousand is 
a quality factor of a thousand, well over the threshold of five for us to use that approximation. Okay. So we could effectively now redraw our circuit as this guy. 0 0.5 volts RMS. So here's our 20 ohm resistor. Here's our 10 millihenry inductance. And then we would have what is effectively a 10 ohm resistor in series with our 10 nanofarad capacitance and the voltage drop across our capacitance is the voltage drop across those two elements in series, right? Um, so I'm still taking the voltage drop at the same nodes as I was previously. Toby? <laughs> yep. Nope, Q is a thousand. So we're looking for the Q of just let, let me let me clarify that. Sorry, I went too far. Of just this parallel form. Right. So not the Q of the system as a whole, but just the Q of the thing that we're transforming. So in this particular form, what I find, just because we're running low on time, is that the capacitor voltage was going to come out to be 16.667 with an angle of approximately 90 degrees. I got like 89.427 or something like that. Uh, but if I had used the um, approximation, it would come out like this. So this is roughly two thirds of the size of what our expected value is. And it's because of the error introduced by our measurement device. So what impact is this going to have on the resonant frequency of the circuit? So omega naught prime, where this is just including the contribution of the multimeter, is actually gonna be 99.995 kiloradians per second which means our resonant frequency changed by four point, actually let's just call it five times 10 to the minus 3%. So it didn't change our resonant frequency practically at all. Our quality factor changed fairly significantly. So it went from 50 to 33.3 repeating. So that means the change in our quality factor due to our measurement circuitry was 33.33%, which is also the change in the voltage that we saw. And then our bandwidth actually would increase to approximately 3,000 radians per second, which means the change in our bandwidth due to us using a multimeter increased by 50%. Right. So... Realistically, if we wanted to measure that voltage at resonance, we should probably be using a different tool than a simple multimeter because it's introducing so much error. So something like a scope might be more appropriate. All right, um, that is enough out of me for today. So I'm going to endeavor to get a homework assignment up for you guys regarding um, series and parallel resonant circuits, as well as these other resonant forms um, today, and it'll be due at some point next week.